A lot of people think about evolutionary psych as it's about sex and aggression. I mentioned that before. You know, it turns out that evolution is about, you know, all of human nature. And humans are group living organisms that get along with others. A lot of young people think, oh, if I'm into evolutionary psych, I should be like Genghis Khan. I should have a lot of mates. I should not care who I hurt along the way. When you're a good person and other people think that you have their interests at heart, they like you, you know? And so in some sense, the most selfish thing you can do, ironically, is to be unselfish. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. With me today, I have two guests. One of them a returning guests. You are actually in... I think the first year of the podcast, yeah. seven years ago, wow. uh, I've, the author of the book Rational Animal back in, in his uh, first appearance, we talked about that. Today, we're going to be talking about solving modern problems with a Stone Age brain with David Lundberg, Kenrick, and Doug Kenrick. Thank you guys so much for uh, for joining me. Right, good it, to be yeah, with you. Thanks for having us. Do so. you prefer Doug or Douglas? Now we've been hanging I like out Doug. all weekend. Doug. You like Doug? Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, we, we now have an informal... Unless you're talking uh, about my research, and then I like it to be Douglas. Douglas. Sounds more distinguished. Very authoritative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I, I've actually I've actually referenced your, uh, your book, The Rational Animal, um, a few times on the show since I've had you on I, and my other uh, show Mind Under Matter that I started a year and a half ago. We we did an episode that was uh, a lot about those those concepts. And so uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be talking about uh, your and, the, and, and then Dave, is this your uh, first book? Uh, this is my first popular press book. We also collaborated on that textbook, Social Psychology uh unraveling the mystery um which uh you can see that one doesn't have my name on it but the other one does the, one, the so, red one um but uh, 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 so, so small. yeah <laughs> um but um so but this is the first sort of book that uh i've done or that we've well it's not the book the first book you've done but certainly the first book we've done together that's sort of for not for a class for like, you know, popular audiences out, out in no. the world. Yeah. So. Oh, wonderful. So human evolution and the seven fundamental motives. So let's, so let's get into uh well, actually before this, why don't you give people a little bit of your backgrounds? Well, I was raised by an evolutionary psychologist, as you will soon find out. Um, uh, just traumatic <laughs> uh, <laughs> on, on one side. And then my mom actually does like corporate, like humor workshops. Um, but, uh, I ended up going to film school, um, and was sort of like, uh, psychology is kind of interesting. Um, until this fundamental motives pyramid that we'll talk about that's central to this book. When I, my dad published that, I rem I was like, Oh, this is really cool because it explains why people in movies make the decisions they make. So like they have to choose, um, well, uh, to give a real brief overview, we'll go into this more, but the seven motives are like, can I, can I see if I can remember them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's see. Okay. Let's test me. Cause I haven't read the new book. All right. All right. It's see. been a while since Whoa. I read the rational animal. We got the night watchman, right? Then th that is okay. So that's okay. the second one. The first one. And this one is like basic survival. Okay. okay. And then. And then the night come, then so we keep going. Night. Well, let's Go see. Ahead. Let's see. Because uh, do I, I need to do them in order? No, too? You wow, know, you're is, really putting no, no, the don't pressure do them in on. Order. This is actually a big thing we're going to talk about. I think it's a big thing we always talk about is whether how much they need to be in order. So just do them in whatever order you think. Okay. The uh, well, I, I like to I like to not forget about disease avoidance. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll just throw that in one end so I don't forget. Then we have uh, uh, affiliative. Uh, okay, sub self, right. we we got yeah, making friends, etc. Uh, working with others, uh, we got status recognition, sub self, mm -hmm. knowing where you are in a specific context. 
um, on on these uh, various hierarchies we find ourselves in. Then you got mate acquisition. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. We all kind of get that. Mate retention. One thing to find a mate, quite another to hold on to one uh, of these yes. things. Uh-huh. Some of us have discovered that. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't discovered the answer, but we have discovered that it's a problem. <laughs> and child rearing. Is that Seven? Uh, Did I get them? That's seven. You got sure. seven. Yes. So, yes. Very good. Yes. Very good. All right. Stuck yes. with me. It, yeah. it was good. a fantastic book. All right. You got a good grade in today's class. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we actually now, there's a couple of refinements that I'll say. So in this book, we talk about sort of basic needs, um, which includes like food and shelter, and then self-protection, which... Uh, that sort of, that's like the night watchman and then disease avoidance. We often go back and forth as to, is that right? Is that a basic need or is that self-protection? And it kind of depends on the context. Uh, and then also mate acquisition includes sort of a mate selection component. Um, so, which is, uh, key for a lot of people. And so, um, but yeah, otherwise you nailed it. So, um, so when I heard about this, I was like, this is a great explanation of why, like what makes something like game of Thrones so compelling, you know, having to see somebody choose between their family and possibly dying and, you know, possibly getting along all these sorts of things. Like these trade-offs seemed really cool. And so, um, yeah, so then we started writing this, we actually started writing this sort of about how these seven motives interact in movies. And then we adapted it to be about how they interact in real life so um there you go right because if you look at popular movies we would always sit around we bike around town together and we talk about the latest movie and you know uh and it's if you look at a movie like say the harry potter so almost any movie is going to have certain fundamental modes but harry potter kind of has it all you know getting the bad guys you know voldemort and uh you know even a bit of getting the girl as he gets a little bit older uh and uh, status. In fact, it's all about status, the relative hierarchy of the different families and, you know, kind of how he starts out under the stairs. Uh, and so we would talk about films generally in that. And then, and then, like Dave said, we started to write a book on because film theory books are all this kind of, you know, social constructivist, mm. really hard to understand, a lot of big words that you're not really sure what they're saying. <laughs> uh, and we thought, well, really what's going on in good movies is that is basically the same stuff that's going on in real life. And so as we started to think about it, we thought, well, why don't we write a book about real life? Because we both have, I have two grandchildren that are Dave's kids. And then Dave has a younger, much younger brother who just turned 18. As we were writing this, here's these kids who are, you know, uh, approaching their teens or in their teens. And we're thinking, what do we know? So uh, to give the background on me, I'm an evolutionary social psychologist, okay? I studied social psychology originally with Bob Cialdini, who does research on social influence. And we, he's a co-author on the text we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I was always interested in animals. I used to raise and, and breed tropical fish. And I used to think it'd be great to be a zoologist. And then I got interested in anthropology in college. Uh, and I was always interested in big theory. And a lot of psychology uh, was kind of narrow, but it was practical. When I was going to graduate school, it was behaviorism, you know, kind of what are the principles that we can use to change our behavior and other people's behavior? But it wasn't a big, big theory. And it was not satisfying to think, well, Everything we do is what we've been rewarded for since birth. So evolutionary psychology comes along very, you know, integrative across disciplines. What do we know about other animals and where do we fit in that? What do we know about other cultures and what do we fit in that? So I gradually got to the point where most of my research was guided by questions about human nature. Uh, did a lot of research on, you know, mate, mating originally when I was young, I studied, I studied sex and aggression, which is most people's stereotype of evolutionary psych. And as I got older and th- started to slow down and maybe my testosterone levels went down, I became interested in things like family values and taking care of your, taking care of your kids. Uh, and it turns out that all of that, you know, all of evolution, evolutionary psychology should be about all of human nature. It should be about our good and our bad, you know, our selfish and our unselfish aspects. And, you know, the, the all of that is there, you know, and, and including the stuff that little kids have to deal with, like, 
figuring out who are the good guys and the bad guys and, you know, f protecting themselves from strangers and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so as we were writing this book, we kind of went back and looked at a bunch of anthropological literature and most of the chapters. So the, the basic format of a chapter in here is, but if we can switch, can we switch to talk about the book now or did you steer the ship? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, be, because, because these, these seven fundamental mo just to, just to go back to get even more basic, what you're, what kind of you're getting at is when I listed those seven um, that you've updated, um, it, what you're ultimately getting at is looking at what any species would kind of need to pass their genes on and in, in humans in particular um, might have uh, uh, some ones that vary from uh, in terms of like social life or even child rearing some yes. species don't have child rearing things exactly. like that so in particular what uh, what would if you're an alien anthropologist coming down looking what does this human species need to replicate its genes right so i mean if you want to take the one we'll go first a little in the intellectual realm there's a, a theory called life history theory that says that all animals need to basically first develop their bodies, they call that somatic effort, okay, and then they need to replicate, because that's what, that's what genes are designed to do. Uh, but mammals do a little more than that, they take care of their offspring, although humans are unique, not fully unique, a lot of other primates, in fact, uh, have paternal involvement, but most mammals, it's the female does all the work, the male just displays his feathers or whatever, or his big horns, and says, choose me, choose me. But in humans, the male hangs around. Uh, and so we have families, okay? And humans also are, compared to some other, like I think orangutans are a little bit more solitary. We always lived in groups of, you know, 25 to 50 or 100 uh, other individuals. So we need to get along, not just with our family members, but with our other kin. And that's one of our strengths is cooperation. Uh, so we have... So there's some levels in the hierarchy that not all mammals have. Not all mammals have parenting. Uh, and, uh, you know, not all other animals is, are as hierarchical as primates are. Uh, and so, yeah, so this is sort of like life history theory turned combined with Maslow's old hierarchy of, of human motives. And so what we do in the book is we basically ask the question of, okay, uh, how can we use that to understand that? So now I'll take one other step in a slightly different, the applied direction. We're living in the modern world. You've got, you know, I see you, you're using your cell phone to record some of what we're doing. You know, I've got my cell phone here always in my pocket. I thought, should I leave it in my office? Oh, I better have it with me. Just <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't. It, it, something it being out of my right. pocket right now, they're like, well, okay, I can see it. I can yeah, see yeah, it. It's, it's okay. Yeah. I, can, <laughs> I remember, uh, this is just a total tangent, but I was, I, I hiked the Grand Canyon and I didn't have cell phone service. Ooh. Like, and I went like by myself and I met people along the way. We sang songs and everything. But when I was coming back up and I got cell phone service again, and I got all my text messages. I was like, oh, like I'm alive, you know, like, <laughs> like you made it. Yeah. So, I made it back um, to civilization. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what even are we without data? Yeah. Know, it's like, <laughs> right. It's amazing. <laughs> was, is, is a life that's not, you know, that's not shared and liked that's and right. subscribed to even worth living? You know, right. that's really the question. Well, they days. say the unexamined life is, <laughs> right. is not worth living. Now the unconnected life. Yeah. Is not worth yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so anyway, so we have these devices and we have lots of other devices. I have a car that practically drives itself. Uh, I have a nice house. I have a pool. I can... I d can't get lost. If I went into the Grand Canyon, I, I would at least still have GPS, even if I have cell phone service. I would know where I was. I could find my way back. Uh, and I can actually find where's the nearest store that I can get Ben and Jerry's ice cream if I'm hungry. Uh, and our ancestors, they had to search really hard for food. They couldn't just check out the nearest supermarket and they could get lost in the woods. Uh, they didn't have nice houses. They didn't have wall. Even the poorest of us, mostly, even if you live in a little apartment, it, it, you know, a little sh ramshackle sort of place where, you know, winos rent rooms for, you know, 
$10 a night. You still have walls and a roof over you. Our ancestors would have loved that. They would have thought, this is, you people are living in such a wonderful life. Why the hell are you so miserable, right? You know, that's sort of the question. It's like, People are miserable, and they're getting more miserable. If you look, I've just seen statistics. The teenage kids in the last 30 years have been getting more and more miserable, okay? Yeah. Uh, and, and depression rates have gone up over the last century. And so some, is that just counting error, or is there, is there some problem that, in fact, in some ways, our technology could be hurting us? Oh, well, the status recognition subself is, is, is certainly looking at, at Instagram and, and seeing this oh. filtered, photoshopped version of someone else's reality that they aren't, they aren't capturing their, their uh, humdrum days and they certainly aren't capturing their worst moments. They're right. often capturing their, the very best meal that they had on the most exciting vacation. And the best you know, angle on their face when their hair right. looks the best, you know, yeah, with no, nice it's, light. It's hard to not feel like everyone else has a yacht. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and they're like every, yeah, exactly. And every meal is like perfectly laid out. And I'm like, and I'm sitting in my house, like eating straight out of the fridge and it's scrolling and thinking, man, I'm really far behind. So not, and not to mention with, with, uh, a, a mate acquisition being a very different thing with with dating sure. apps and and things and uh, which may be hurting mate retention uh, a little bit or or the the drive to retain mates of if you're if you're being fed to this idea of like well look there's a zillion potential so I, I i i'm not sure it's actually helping mate acquisition that much i'd read some study the other day about like ah oh, i wish i could remember the percent but it was the percent of both men and women who would just were like they'd quit dating they were yes. like i'm so sick of dating apps and oh, i'll have to look it up no uh, there are more there are more single people now than there used to be 20, 30 years ago before the iPhone. You think, well, well, they should all find each other. Well, no, they don't. Because, well, we talked to uh, another social psychologist and she was single at the time. And she said, I'll be on, on a date with one guy and I'll think he's okay. But if I go home, I might have a message from a better guy. <laughs> right. okay? uh, oh. And so I think that does, you know, people are always thinking, well, why should I settle for this one person, you know, when there's so many other uh possible options. And if I look at the photographs of myself that I put, put on Facebook, I'm very attractive, you know? Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so people, uh, people are in some ways made more miserable. Not always. I mean, there are advantages. Finding your way around is nice. You know, being able to find food is nice. It's, it's not like it's all bad, but there's this, it, there's this question of what, what evolutionary psychologists call mismatch. Okay. Where basically the the modern world is basically not set up the way the ancestor world was set up. And a lot of what we talk about in the book is, so we'll open up, first of all, we'll describe a case study of somebody who's, who's confronting a, a modern world problem, okay? Uh, so one of the, the, in the chapter on basic survival, we talk about a guy whose name is, I think, Walter Hudson, is that? He lived in uh, Brooklyn uh, and uh, he was got to the point where he was 1,197 pounds. And I, I might be rounding error, but it was like he was over 1,100 pounds. Uh, and uh, that could never have happened in the ancestral environment because you had to move every day and you had to search for food every day and you didn't have pizza you know, and he used to drink giant bottles of soda, multiple giant bottles of soda and multiple hamburgers, you know, and he had family members who loved him and cared about him. So it would bring him food to keep him happy because he was hungry. Yeah, people all the liked time. him a lot, apparently. Like he was yeah. a very friendly yeah, guy. He was very, oh. he was, uh, but that, you know, that wouldn't have happened in the ancestral environment. And that's because, uh, again, our ancestors had to exercise and they had to search for food. I had uh, Herman Ponser at, at, at Duke, who um, he he studies the um, the evolution of our metabolisms and and mm -hmm. and things. I guess this is main thing but he he lives with the hansa people of uh, uh, every summer, mm -hmm. a few months out of the year, and um, and he said something that. It, it just blew my, it was a simple little modern fact. And I just 
had never thought about it and it blew my mind he uh, it was a live recording with people and he asked how how what percentage of people are in the modern um food uh food system like, like food distribution and and mm-hmm. uh, food industry um rather and it's 2% 2% of modern uh, people are are procuring and delivering and doing all of the, all food, of the food for the rest all of the rest us you asked the hansa 100 percent right. <laughs> right and so now it's so easy to get the food and so that poses so what we talk about in the book is we talk about okay so here was what it was like ancestrally okay and here's oh, incidentally another statistic on just in the last 50 years the UN keeps track of how many people are starving and how many people are dying of different diseases. And it used to be that there were you know, more problems with starvation. And now it's switched around. So more people are dying of overeating-related diseases, of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, things where they got too much of a good thing compared to people who die of starvation. So we've now switched into that mode. And so we have a problem. And the question is, how do you deal with it? And there is a lot of psychology. So we t- this is sort of an advice book. It's a well, bit before, like- Before you get into the advice, ahead. I just want to sort of say, because this is a theme that I think goes through not just food, but all seven motives. And But when you think about food, you can almost think that we've gone from a world of food scarcity, right? Where there's not enough food for mouths. And to some extent, globally, we still have that. But like in America, we've actually reached this sort of world of like, mouth scarcity, where food companies are competing to get you to eat their food, food. which leads to us having these foods like ice cream and soda that are like super refined and super sugary. Right. And so, and, and, and these, uh, these once exceptionally adaptive preferences for this sugar to, to, to have a heightened vigilance for a berry or, or, or or to speaking of the Hansa climbing way up in a tree, risking your life, risking your life to get honey. honey. Yes. (laughs) That used to be a major cause of death actually is falling out of trees when you're searching i for believe food. it i've yeah. seen video of a pig it's, done. it's so mind blowing and now not only do we have things competing for our mouths we have things competing for our fear mechanisms right which we can talk about with oh, like yeah. social media and things and we have things competing for like we have these different forms of technology that are like getting more and more concentrated yeah to try to get our attention and super so, concentrated yeah, yeah. right so. well if you think about it wherever there's a strong desire so what do we, our ancestors had a strong desire to find food, okay? That creates an, a marketing opportunity and it creates an opportunity for businesses to satisfy that desire. So it's kind of, you think, well, that's a good thing, okay? But it actually, like with Ben and Jerry's, it can be too much of a good thing. Uh, and so you guys were talking about the dating apps, for example. Is it really a good thing? Our ancestors would have met, uh, there was another guy who worked maybe with the Hadza, Marlow, uh, and he said that the average person in that group would have met maybe 10 possible uh, marriage partners in their life that were the right age and, you know, that were available. Uh, and so now, if you walked across this campus, you could see, uh, you could see a thousand partners. You actually, more than a thousand, there, there are 30,000 students just at ASU. You could walk across our campus and see you know, thousands of possible mates. And if you go onto your apps for dating, you can see one after the other, you know, you can swipe through more than our ancestors would have seen in their entire life. You can do it in like 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, And also you can look at people who have these characteristics that are, uh, you know, that are simply, that look extremely attractive, okay? People are healthier now than they ever were. And so seeing all these healthy, beautiful people, and as you were saying before, why should I settle for one when there's possibly others out there who might be, you know, who might be better? And that sounds okay, but I think that might contribute to depression, you know, when we think, you know, I mean, I know I had one period of being single before any of these apps, and I had what you might call mating success with a few partners. And I found it kind of depressing to have short term. I mean, Dave thinks I'm a little uh, Catholic boy on this, but it's like... Uh, you know, I find it a little depressing to not 
be finding true love, you know? I, I often, I, I often find myself, um, experiencing depression just generally when there is like an abundance of, of choice, say in my career or anything mm -hmm. in, in kind of too much. And, and it, it, it's, it's a bit, it feels like my brain pumping the brakes a little bit before investing in one yeah. path and kind mm -hmm. of like, hold on, are you sure that's the right path and the kind of indecision and uh, of it, and, uh, sort of analysis paralysis. Yeah. Um, that I, I think maybe some of that happens when, when we have so many choices. Yeah. To well, and, and also there's stress, you know, there's always this, these studies where it's like, even if you get a new job, it's stressful, you know? And so, and with, it's the same with mating, you know, like, um, well, it's really fun to start a new relationship. It's like, it's, it sort of monopolizes your mind. You know what I mean? Like, and so that's, and then if you're like starting one and then stopping one, that's also stressful. And then, you know, so that, that's, it's a lot of work, you know, <laughs> like it's a lot of work. Right. Um, so, and so yeah. all of, all of these, yeah. Uh, these, uh, seemingly attractive alternatives. So I know one thing, one thing that I like about my familial arrangement is that, you know, like Dave grew up on the other side of the continent for me because his mom and I split. Now he lives near me. Okay. And his mom lives nearby and his younger brother lives nearby. And my, you know, his younger brother's grandmother lives nearby. And that's actually kind of nice because we have periods of stress you know, and when my teenage son is stressed, he wants to talk to Dave, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and Dave's here. And so, you know, when we follow our career opportunities, they take us away from our family. We may make more money, but it isn't necessarily going to be better for us in every way. I mean, there are some ways in which relatives are a pain, but nevertheless, <laughs> there's something, there's something, you know, what our ancestors were used to was having relatives they could rely on. If they fell apart, there's people who share 50% of their genes or 25 or 12% of their genes that care about them just because we're all kind of genetically in this together. But in the modern world, you know, your friends, they have a shorter rope than your relatives do. Okay. They'll help you, you know, uh, and it's great to have friends. We need friends. But, you know, if you totally fall apart, then they're going to start to, you know, not have the bandwidth to take care of you, whereas your relatives always have the bandwidth to take care of you. So there's some things about kind of trying to recreate a little bit of the old natural environment that are good. Even if you can't be with your relatives, I think staying in regular contact with them, you know, one nice thing I think are the, like Zoom, for example, is a beneficial new kind of technology where you can actually see the face of the person you're talking to. So I know that my friend uh, Mark Schaller teaches at UBC, and uh, he and uh, his uh, his wife—they're not married; they're partners. Okay, you know. But uh, and my wife and I uh, hadn't seen them for two years during the epidemic, so we weren't allowed to cross the border. So we had a Zoom meeting, and we, you know, got a bottle of wine on each side, and we sat there, and it, that was actually nice. You know, that was. I, I loved the, that. I spent so much time with, with, uh, connecting over zoom. I, I even had, um, for the first time ever I, I had, I started putting out on, on uh, Patreon for my fans to like, we would have virtual board game nights and things oh. like that. I, I absolutely love it. <laughs> loved it. There were, you know, there was, uh, it is almost like being it's it's much better it, than text messaging. It was you the know. difference I I spend I feel like I'm the only one left uh, or at least of my age um uh or older or or younger who still spends time on a phone. Like I'm going to drive from ASU here to LA afterwards and I'll call friends on the phone that I know also uh -huh. talk on the, I have a lot of friends, but uh. to get hardly any of them on the phone is like, I, they, it, and some people will catch up and they'll like, they'll text like, how are you doing? What have you been up? I'm not going to sit and text you what I've been up to over the last three years of my life. It's so, it's such a weird modern. One of my, one of my best friends is a friend that I went to film school with my friend, Nick. Um, and I don't think I've seen him in 
10 years. Wow. Yeah. We talk on the phone all yeah. the time, you know, mm. and, and that is, that's a wonderful connection. Like, so yeah, the pho- phones are, phones are pretty good technology in terms of affiliation. So, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, I think the Zoom thing is even better. If you can see a person's yeah. face, it really does. It's almost like it's just, it's lacking very little of natural interaction. And so it isn't like technology is all bad. Uh, but anyway, so what we talk about in the book a lot is, so here's the mismatch, okay? And here's the way in which our fundamental motives get exploited by corporations that are trying to make money. And often they're trying to make money by doing something we want, okay? They're not, they're not cheating us. They're just giving us too good of a satisfaction for a need that we normally had to work for. But how do you deal with it when things get out of hand? You know, when, uh, you know, when, for example, you've, you know, you're, you're eating too much. Uh, and it turns out that psychology does have a lot of useful uh, information. And one of the ones that I think goes across the different motivational systems is what's called stimulus control. It's basically, uh, we are pretty good at controlling our environments, at setting up. So for example, I can not bring home to a, a case of IPA and a big, you know, five bags of chocolate from the supermarket. But if they're there in my house, <laughs> we're really bad at resisting temptation. Don't, don't think I'm going to develop willpower. I mean, this bull crap, you're not going to develop. We don't have that much willpower to resist chocolate and tasty beer. Okay. But we do have enough planning. We're capable. Humans are capable. We do have a frontal cortex. And when we go to the supermarket, we can say, you know, first of all, don't go hungry to the supermarket, you know, and when you do buy healthy things and stock it in your house, because we're also kind of lazy. And if I decide I want chocolate at 10 o'clock at night and I don't have any in the house, I'm not going to get out and go there. But if, if it's four in the afternoon when I don't even want chocolate, if it's laying on my counter, in fact, in the office here, when I go to talk to, you know, one of the administrative assistants, they always have a, you know, this is a big bowl of really tasty chocolate in there. Oh, yeah. No, I, I've, I've I, I feasted cannot, off of that thing. I so, cannot pass okay. it. They get a lot more visitors. Yeah. I <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so this is this is an interesting, I realize we're kind of jumping all over the place, but I I, th- that's totally. par for the course okay. on this show. So, so what I was going to say is, mentioning this bowl, there's these... The other big thing that comes up with these motives that we talk about on the book is trade-offs, right? And and like you said, they get a lot more visitors. Sharing food is a fantastic affiliation strategy, right? Like it's one of the best, most ingrained things that if you share food with somebody, you guys are you're on the same team, right? So having that bowl, it has its pros. It, it does. I, I mean, th- this is one of the, you know, I, I have a tricky relationship with alcohol where I, I usually have like an all or nothing kind of relationship <laughs> with it. I have long bouts of surprise. I, I never intend to like stop drinking forever, but I take long breaks and then I, I get into it again. I, I, you know, I, I I go for it a little bit. <laughs> sure. Uh, it usually goes very well for a while until it gets a little old. Um, but the social component of it is what is so tricky. I, I haven't I haven't really, you know, I've been doing this sober October. I haven't really missed alcohol much or anything. But, you know, go out with some new friends uh, to a bar after a conference and everything. It's like, eh, kind of, I'm fine to just be hanging out with everyone, but there is sort of like, you see everyone else doing it. There's so a I social noticed, component. Right, there's pressure. Well, even like, well, Dave is in a long sober yeah, so I, I've totally stopped drinking. And, and I do find there's a real trade-off, like even at this conference, I don't know, like we went out the one night. I had my glass of water and then I just got up and I was like, I'm going to go home and go to sleep. Right. And, and in some ways that's not all bad because then I'm prioritizing, I'm hearing that voice in my head. That's like, you need sleep that like that health motive, right. At the bottom of the pyramid is ringing a bit louder. Um, which I think was actually nice. Like by the third day when I feel like I was showing up and everybody seemed hung over and I was like, Hey guys, we're ready to start recording. Um, but, but it does make being out at the bar or just out to dinner, it's a lot tougher. Um, and I also think I, I don't get invited as much, right? Like I think there is this, there's this real social trade-off to 
to not drinking. So, um, yeah, they liked the old pantsless Dave. They, that was, that, 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 who knows what was going to happen. That is, that, I, <laughs> that is true. That's a very on the nose. Um, but, uh, um, one of, one of my two arrests in my life. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Alcohol. I took a wild stab pants. at it with the um, old cliche. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so, I- <laughs> so there's a lot of trade-offs. And, and, and this is uh, as we, um, you know, had uh, at, at least in our developed nation, um just experienced our, our first major pandemic and all sorts of trade-offs between this affiliate of uh sub self and disease avoidance sub self and all and and mate acquisite well this is this is just a regular sort of th- where where if i were to um i i mean if if i were to Take, spit up into the air and catch it in my own mouth i would be disgusted by that <laughs> this disease of what yeah. it's my own spit sure. it just but, left but it's in my it's mouth spit. right now yeah. it just left it for a few seconds and that's revolting to <laughs> yeah. me but the 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 idea of of Everybody exchanging s- saliva yes, with right. with Everybody with a potential mate out. yes right is, is is suddenly that that disease avoidance gets completely kind of shut down in in many ways it's so fascinating though like the way over covid when one motive was primed like just to see how much people would and wouldn't trade off these other things, you know, because you saw all these people being like, well, I still got to go work, right? I've still got to go to my job. And also people still hung out with family, right? Like it seems like everybody had their COVID bubble, you know, where it's like, well, hold on, we're going to put this, we're not going to put this above kin care, right? Um, But we might put this above affiliation. Um, And so, uh, yeah, that, that's it was basically. interesting. I mean, in the end, though, people ended up just like that's what I think a lot, a lot of the fights were about. People said, "I'm not, I don't want to stay home anymore, and I yeah. don't want to wear masks anymore." And you know, I was not one of those people, but I could sort of sympathize. You know, sure. I mean, I I was conveniently located in the sense of having my family near me, so I had social contacts. But I could see that if you were if you were off by yourself, it'd be like, I, I'm willing to risk it, you know? And, uh, and disease avoidance is, is such a odd one of, of, of the seven. It's a, it, it's a little less tangible. Like when you say mate acquisition, anyone can relate to like what that looks right. like and mate retention and kin care child. You can physically see what it looks like. The status is very easy to conceptualize. Uh, we, we've all had bosses or employees or whatever and, and uh, been in different stages of a hierarchy and, and, uh, and affiliated and had friendship. But the disease is so nuanced and it's so, and, and how it evolved, the, the idea of like our, our ancestors that maybe happened to just have some skittishness towards certain cues of, right. of a pale, uh, 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 abnormally that. pale skin, um, in a, in a, uh, a uh, given individual or, mm-hmm. um, or like coffee, like if, 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 if coughing, if if being coughed on or something like that were good for you, you we would be living in a world where it would be like this great act of generosity to cough. And if you if you sneezed, like people would be scrambling to. It would be like you just threw a bunch of money in the air or, or something like that. You know that our ancestors didn't die of epidemic diseases because they didn't have that much contact with outside groups. They died of diseases that they got from. The local animals, if they caught an animal and they cut the animal up and they had a cut on their hand, they would catch a disease from the local animals Ah. and the the organisms in the ground around them. They didn't typically catch it from uh, other people and other groups. So this is an interesting thing when COVID played out is you notice when when we're afraid, and you guys talk about this, not specifically with COVID, but in the rational animal, when people are afraid. We like to get together, right? And you saw that even when there was a fear of disease at the very beginning, before there were like really strict, like stay at home, there were a lot more people like socializing, like going to like those first few weeks of COVID, 
before lockdown, there were people hanging out in big groups. And I think part of that was we were afraid, right? And and our brain wasn't like, well, wait, 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 this is a thing where you shouldn't hang out with other people for protection. It was like, well, we're afraid. We should all get together. We should all stay in this one room and then everything will be safe. And then it was like, it took a lot of like practice to be like, oh, wait, no, no. It was no. a little unnatural yeah. to it. So. Yeah. To be told to socially distance and to stay out of large groups. Uh, yeah. That was very interesting. So anyway, back on this, back on the, uh, these, uh, on the book, uh, one of the, the other things that we do in here. So we talk about what was it like amongst the Hadza? What was it like amongst the Yanomamo? And every chapter opens up with a, uh, a sort of a little mini ethnography of what was this motive like? What was it okay. like in this society to deal, in a traditional society, to deal with finding mates, to deal with getting status? So status, for example, another case in which there are only a couple of levels of status in traditional groups. Now we have people who make thousands of times more than we do thousands of times. Nobody in the ancestral environment made more than, you know, they might've had four or five times the skill at hunting that you had. Okay. But they didn't have thousands of times more. They didn't have enough money that they could build a rocket ship for their own <laughs> recreational entertainment and own giant, you know, 200 foot yachts and, and this, this is over hundreds of thousands of years. And now this, this now very sliver. Uh, and, and this is actually just in the time I'm 42, just in the time in the 42 years that I've been alive, it's gone from CEOs of, of large companies making 30 times the average employee to 300 times yeah, the yeah, average employee. It's gone crazy. And, and in fact, so there's all these different levels that there didn't used to be. And in fact, when you go on your media, you hear about Elon Musk and you hear about rich people all the time. And we begin to think, well, gee, what's wrong with me? Look how much money. I was just reading yesterday, Kanye West, you're telling me he's you know, got emotional he's, problems, but he's making hundreds of millions of dollars from just making, from putting his name on a sweatshirt, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so... And you think, oh, gee, Kanye West is making millions of dollars from putting his name on sweat. What's wrong with me? Why am I not? I haven't even made, you know, my first million dollars on anything. <laughs> Have you tried putting your name on a sweatshirt, though? I should try it. I think uh, uh, try you it. maybe I just got to give it a shot. <laughs> yes, either that or put my name on an electric car or put an Italian guy's name on an electric I, car. Well, I think, I'd see, I think we start with the sweatshirt idea. That's, that's, the, idea. Cheapest, so, that's yeah, the cheapest option. Yeah, All right, just, ah, uh, we got it. All right. Kenrick well, Lundberg, Kenrick sweatshirts. So. Right. Um, that sounds good. Um, no, but anyway, so what we do in the book is we'll talk about a, a case study of somebody uh, in the modern world, you know, like, so friendship is another, let's return to friendship because it's one that I think is a fun topic that we kind of skimmed over. We open up talking about uh, a guy, a young Jewish kid growing up in Nazi occupied uh, France at the beginning of, you know, World War II. And he wasn't able to make any friends because, uh, because his parents didn't want anybody to discover that he was Jewish. They had fled from Paris and were living in the woods somewhere, living in a, a, in a farm area, and nobody was Jewish around them. And the Nazis were asking that people turn in Jews. And so this young kid had no friends uh, and then eventually he, uh, the war ended, he's managed to survive and he moved to Israel and his name was Daniel Kahneman. And, uh, he had one of the most famous friendships in science, Kahneman and Tversky, which in psychology, those are names that are sort of like, yeah. you know, Darwin Legends, and Wallace, yeah, yeah. you know, they're just giant names. Okay. Uh, and they founded the field to some extent of behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this friendship that they had was something that wouldn't have occurred in the, in the ancestral world. Uh, they both ended up living in Israel, but one of them was born in Israel. But the other one was born in France, you know, over a thousand miles away. Uh, they had very different kinds of backgrounds, but they, you know, ended up moving close together and then getting jobs that were similar to one another. They worked in the same university. And, uh, and so one of the things we, you know, what we like to do when we open these case studies is say, look, here's a, a funny case of somebody who had a problem, okay, no friends. And then he, 
more or less solved it by becoming extremely useful. He got a lot of knowledge. And that's one of the things that we do for friends in the modern world that didn't used to be done. It was actually, I, I take that back. Anybody who had knowledge, like um, Kim Hill, or not Kim Hill, Rob Boyd talks about the ability to build a canoe. If you had technological knowledge and you could share it with your group, they really respected you. Okay, and so Kahneman is a good example of this. Develop some knowledge he could share with other people. And now, you know, Kahneman is 90 years old or so. I don't know, but uh -huh. he might be mad if he hears this and he's only 87, but he's, he's no spring chicken. And he has lots and lots and lots of friends, you know, still possibly a somewhat reserved guy. Uh, but because he was useful to others. So one of the things, you know, people often talk about separating your friendship and your work. I actually think that's kind of a mistake. I think that, in fact, we like doing things. We like making things with one another, you know? So if you're, you know, if you know about I, video and- I actually have, a, I have an example. Cause, cause I think also even saying separating from your friendship and your work, well, just finding ways to collaborate with people. So like you mentioned, you do game nights with people, right? Um, like over Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another thing you could even do is have a, all right, all like have all your patrons come on zoom and one of them says i'm trying to fix my dishwasher and then everyone else just gives them advice right like you just find ways to like work on projects um and uh um with your friends as well um so mostly home appliance projects too. mostly mostly the uh, that, those are the best <laughs> those, are, those are the ones that really unite people the, oh. the most you know but i i did have a time with two of my close friends that we would always play board games with and board games are kind of competitive and one time one of them was just like can you guys help me try to fix my car the car door stuck and we were like none of us knew anything about cars but we were like we can know how to youtube things and it was one of our best days ever just figuring really? out how to fix this guy's car door so yeah it's uh That's, it is interesting that when you work on something it's actually fun. I hate working on things myself. Oh, damn, I've got something broken. But if Dave comes over and helps me fix it, you know, uh, or if I go to your house and help you fix your swamp cooler, I hate opening a swamp cooler, but if right. I can help with you with fix other people, your swamp it is, cooler, it's... then it's kind of a game and it's kind of fun. Uh, mm, so, And so oh. I think, you know, making yourself useful is a very, it's a, it's a nice sort of trick, you know, rather than thinking, how can I be just entertaining or what could I say to someone to start a conversation? Help somebody, you know. Somebody was talking about this. The guy from Hungary, uh, Tomas, Tomas uh, David, Barrett. David Barrett, was talking about this Burning Man thing. And apparently that they have this economy of gifts where what you do is you just give things to people. And apparently people really end up really getting really close to one another. And so, you know, that's, you know, do something nice for somebody. And that's a better, rather than asking what other people can do for me, you can ask, what can I do for somebody else? Go do some volunteer That's work. True. Although if mean? somebody does something for you, actually expressing gratitude, like, and uh, like, cause a lot of times people will get in this cycle of being like, well, I'll do things for other people. But if someone does something for me, then no, 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 no. I don't want to be a burden. But actually it turns out that accepting favors from people is also a really good way. Cause yeah. it lets them demonstrate status. It lets them demonstrate generosity. So both, you want to both give and receive. So, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, 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 having, having just done my, my own first festival and then having attended more like kind of camp out festivals, which are, you know, you're, you're making your, your accommodations and everything yourself for a weekend and, and sometimes figuring out your own food, there's usually food trucks and stuff. But when you're in a situation like that, people will just instinctively be like, hey, can I help you with that tent yeah. or whatever? And 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 almost everyone there hasn't built a tent in <laughs> years or or whatever potentially. And they're not the hardest thing in the world to figure out, but they're a little intimidating to do it by yourself. And and it really uh, unites people. Yeah. Well, that also and that gets us back to nature. You know, I take my, I took my kids camping last week, and um, or maybe it was a month ago. But normally, like getting them to come upstairs and do stuff was like, it's a, it's a challenge, but like out there, it was like, we wake up and my son's chopping firewood because it was like wilderness camping, you know? And so like, and my daughter is out there like getting the fire started. And it's like, we're all, we're all doing this because I don't know, we're designed for it, you know? So, I mean, maybe we're not exactly designed to set up a, a tent, but, uh, 
We're designed to yeah. have shelter. So. Yeah. I think that actually doing something productive, one of the problems with computer games, I'm sort of an opponent of computer games. I'm always fighting with Dave's younger uh, brother about this. Uh, but I feel like, you know, the name of the computer games is what can, how can I get entertained? And you're not really doing anything unless you're playing with your friends, you know, you're not really doing anything. And there's just something that makes you feel good or it doesn't make you titillated with joy, but it just makes you feel like I have a function here when you're actually doing something with other, when you're actually making something or solving a problem with other people in the real world. Uh, I think it's a, it's, you know, it's a very important part of life that we're losing when we're letting these computers entertain us and, you know, satisfy our status motives with fake points that don't mean anything in the real world, uh, which, you know, actually kids who spend a lot of time uh, playing computer games, their grades, shockingly, go down. Uh, and so I think a lot of, a, a lot of the problems of modern life come from just too much dependence on these devices that are a little bit too good Right. At satisfying our motives in ways that are really not what we need. And one one of the one of the really, really difficult uh tricky things about it is that as you're like getting a getting a call here and everything. From my that, son, from uh, Liam, who's so, so the, this is <laughs> this is a great use of this this technology, yes. but then you you go to do that or send an, a business email. Mm -hmm. And then also you do have this game right there. But yeah. my, my sober October for me, it was, it wasn't anything like necessarily, um, it didn't have to be about alcohol or it was just all whatever vices are. So alcohol can be a vice for me or tobacco or TV or this very stupid game teach you. It's like Euchre mm -hmm. or, or spades or clubs or something that's a partner based trick taking game. And I got playing it online during the, and it's just, <laughs> it's not even that entertaining. I just simply can't stop. And that's been the hardest one. I've, I've, I've done all of them like pretty easily, but it's been the hardest one. And the reason why it's been the hardest one is because I, going back to environmental engineering, I don't have alcohol in my house. Not that many people smoke a, a, anymore. So you're not like constantly surrounded by, mm -hmm buy cigarettes i don't have a tv um well it's, it's like inconvenient uh it's mm -hmm. in an inconvenient place in my in my house and but i need to be on my computer for lots mm -hmm. of other things with all sorts of utilities sending emails it's but then once i'm on there i'm just a couple clicks away oh, that, from this stupid game <laughs> that i can't <laughs> stop playing so i think one of the things that we're going to have to do is eventually it is to learn how to manage ourselves in the same way that when i go to the supermarket i buy kale and I buy healthy food to bring home and I try to avoid, I, I don't buy ice cream anymore, you know. Um, I think we need to get these devices, we need to pre-program them in the same way that I'm, it just doesn't let you. It makes it hard for you to do that during working hours, during certain hours of the day, because it's, you know, it's incredibly hard to. I was talking with Dave's younger brother who was just calling yesterday. I said, well, how about if we have a rule where you don't, play computer games between nine and five. And he looked at me like I had just said something, you know, that I was a Martian. <laughs> and so, it's like, are you serious? Between nine and five, no computer? He actually said that, you know, well, I'm like, come on. And this well, is I, think, I think this goes back yeah. to this idea of like, relying on willpower versus setting up our environment. For me, I don't know that this trick works for everybody, but I was really hooked on online chess and then I didn't do this intentionally, but I actually used status to keep myself from playing online chess. What I did is I I made a mistake and the, my opponent wrote noob move and I went off on them in such a vitriolic, embarrassing <laughs> way that I then deleted my chess.com account and I've never been able to go back <laughs> because I was like, yeah. oh my gosh. So I don't know that that's actually the best thing to do it, but I, I think <laughs> maybe using other social motives, maybe committing... Like with food, I've, I've done things where I will like make public commitments on like Twitter, you know, that I'm like not yeah. going to do this. And I think 
This actually helps. This is a ba basic principle of old behavior modification. If you want to change things, tell other people because they'll help you. Just I do that. You. Yeah, I I blab Make to everyone that I can yeah. when I right. when you I'm like quitting. At the something. conference, you were saying that you're avoiding alcohol. Tell people because otherwise you'll get the continual. Come on, you know, or they'll yeah. pour you a drink and put it right in front of you. Yeah, okay? yeah. and so it helps to tell other people what your plans are. Uh, it also makes it then harder to you back do have out. To, but you have to do that with, with alcohol specifically, I found, in a way that doesn't make people feel like you're judging them. Yeah. Right? That's a tricky one. So I, I actually almost never tell people that I don't drink. Like, Right. I just am like, no, I'm good. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to have some water. So, Well, uh, I mean, going back to this uh, this kind of idea of environmental engineering with going to the grocery store and, you know, not having not having those things that are going to be tempting because using your own laziness of yeah. of not going out to uh, to get chocolate. And, and I, I can actually because it's amazing. You, you almost need to think I. Uh, Whenever you have the space and capacity, I have to go. Future Shane is going to be on autopilot. Then more than I could ever possibly guess. It, it much worse than say this game teach you, which I actually am aware that I'm <laughs> logging on to play things like I. Another thing, I took Instagram off my phone. It was the yeah, only yeah. social media on my phone, and what I discovered, it was so creepy because it was 20 times a day I would go, I would be doing a thing and I would look on my phone and one of the first things I'd do is like scroll to, yeah. I'd be like, where, oh, where, yeah. where, where'd it go? And it, it was, it wasn't like I first went, I need to get on Instagram uh, right now to check my direct messages or something like that. It was just this automatic. Oh, there is. Yeah. I do it with the New York times. They go reading the New York times. That's good. Yeah. It turns out that I can spend hours a day when I could be writing, reading yeah. the New York Times headlines. And the New York Times is actually, it do, does the same as the old New York Daily News used to do, which is the lower, the unhip newspaper in New York. Uh, they're just appealing to my, you know, my fright motives. They're trying to scare me. They tell me all day long, do you know what the Republicans are doing now? Do you have yeah. any idea what's about to come down? You know, and it's like, they scare me 20 times. And they, in fact, inject messages into my email, you know, and, and right, in fact, political their... candidates do this to me always. I've started to now delete to unsubscribe when people, you know, when people scare me all the time, I just, now I have a rule. I'm not going to read the New York Times, you know, more than once a day. Uh, and I, it's often hard because I think, oh, yeah. wait a second. You're about to read the New York Times because you saw there was a headline about he who shall not be named, a yeah, former yeah. leader of uh, a first world country who I don't like to talk about, um, <laughs> but who I'm scared of so, all so, the time. Yeah, I, I just want to say I have started to feel more and more like we as a society, like you were saying, this sort of no vice November, I'm like, we might need like phone free Fridays or phone free yeah. February where everyone just, you know, I, I grew up at a time where I only had a phone in the house, you know, and we somehow all survived. And like, it would be, I do feel like some of these, we might just need to figure out some ways to just collectively say, we're just going to put the whole device away. So, well, um, I mean, what would be the harm if really between nine and five, you didn't have, you figured out a way, even computers are not as dangerous. Although the computers you can trick into being like your cell phone. If, if you're, you know what you're doing. And the problem is we work on computers. So we're always prey. We're sitting there for that. Next that's little that's message, the real problem. The next little yeah. message that's going to come along and you're checking your email to see, I might have a message from Dave that has to do with something to do with our book. But then I see, oh, there's another message from somebody who says, do you know what they're doing in right. Oklahoma? You know, and you know, and I'm tempted to read it, but I've learned to say when they scare me, I swipe. I get rid of the message. The problem says, is that the, the algorithms know I've unsubscribed from a lot of political texts. And then they say, they now say you will no longer receive messages from this number. The next day I get a thing from a different phone number. Yeah. So it's tough. So, uh, so as, as we, uh, as we wrap up, um, I really want people to check out, uh, check out this book. Are, are there any, 
Are there any kind of loose ends or anything in, in particular that you want to leave people with? No, I would say, I would say take that book camping, you know, would don't bring your phone. And, uh, <laughs> um, and so, uh, and if well, you like it, give it as a gift to one of your friends or relatives, because yeah. I, I, actually seriously, the, the message that I think is the central, we open up the book. A lot of people think about evolutionary psych as it's about sex and aggression. I mentioned that before. And, you know, it turns out that evolution is about, you know, all of human nature and humans are group living organisms that get along with others. And a lot of young people think, oh, if I'm into evolutionary psych, I should be like Genghis Khan. I should have a lot of mates. I should not care who I hurt along the way uh, and replicate my genes and whatever else. And, you know, in the modern world, we don't really need, and that doesn't, A, we don't need it. And B, it doesn't really make you feel that satisfied. Uh, what what we have as our role model in the first chapter is a woman named Osceola McCarty, and she won a presidential medal of honor from Bill Clinton because what she did, this is a woman who was born in like 1908-ish, okay, and she had to drop out of the fifth grade to help her aunt and her mother in their laundry business. So she spent the rest of her life cleaning people's shirts and pressing the shirts and getting like 10 cents a shirt, but she had very few bills, because they owned their own house. And she never had any kids, but she became a member of her church and she saved all of her pennies. And she had this giant bank account. She had like the equivalent now of half a million dollars for a person who's living in a, a, in a small house with no payments and you know no colored television, no car. And her banker said, well, what do you want to do with your money, Osceola? You should invest it. She said, I don't need it. I want to give it away. And so a woman who dropped out of the fifth grade, uh, she set up a scholarship fund for African-American girls to go to college, you know, over 70 years later. Uh, and that's somebody who lived not only an honorable life, but, you know, she was happy and people respected her. In fact, she had to say, don't hold me up on such a, I'm not a, a you know, you, I, I'm, I, I don't want to be up like a statue. I'm a regular person, just like the rest of you. I just didn't need that money. I wanted to do something good with it. That, I think, being kind to others is actually good for us because it makes us valued by our community and it actually wins us true respect instead of phony respect that we might get, you know, for driving some flashy car and having 10 times more money than the next person. When you're a good person and other people think that you have their interests at heart, they like you, you know? And so in some sense, the most selfish thing you can do, ironically, is to be unselfish. And I think that's a general message for romantic relationships, for getting ahead on the job, for your friendships, you know, uh, for your family members. If you do things for other people, it's kind of a funny trick to lead a more fulfilling life yourself. So the more of these books you buy and give away to people, <laughs> the better you'll actually. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and everyone should also be uh, patrons for you, you know. And so, so they should not just be given to us; they should be given to you. Um, <laughs> I do also want to say just one last thing in terms of giving uh, away. Uh, also, everyone should check out Zombified, which is the... Oh, yes. Oh, no, geez. Yeah. I'm sorry. Please pl <laughs> plug away. We just had such a wonderful, uh, wonderful weekend with a uh, insane... I was so jealous of the the studio and the the setup the, is, is just incredible and the, and, and the guests including you i feel like like and, and so like we had such a great time we had so so zombified is this podcast that's um where we look at the ways we're sort of manipulated by all sorts of things for good and bad from disease to technology to music and humor you know and uh and so yeah people should check that out uh, Channel Z on YouTube, or you can just look for the Zombified podcast. And so. and you you guys will be familiar with uh, with David's co host Athena Actippus, who's been on the show multiple times and has a uh, the regular occurring um, monthly show over the next few months on there. So uh, so yeah, check that out. Thank you guys so much, um, uh, Douglas. Douglas, because I feel like you've <laughs> you've established your authority over the course of this. So we'll go with Douglas. You were Doug to begin with. Now you're <laughs> Douglas Kenrick and uh, David Lundberg Kenrick. 
Uh, thank you guys both so much for joining me. And thank you, listeners and viewers, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next thank week. You, Shane.